good to be back together. Thank you so much for joining us on this Sunday morning. I'm Daisy. And I'm Jake. And welcome to those who've joined us from our Guildford morning service too. Well done for not turning up to the Ivanano. <laughs> this week is the start of Advent. What does that mean? Well, after today, we only have three Sundays left until Christmas. Oh my goodness. We'll keep you posted about um, all things Christmas in the upcoming weeks. Yeah. Now, before we move on to what we have coming up in the service, how good has it been going through our series on James? It has been pretty good. Um, we were chatting about it together and we both felt challenged by the Taming the Tongue talk, didn't we? Mm. Um, specifically considering um, the words we use and how we use them for good. Yeah, it's definitely been a good series. It's been really challenging, it's been great. So today we have a great service coming up. We have our Aldershot Town Pastor, Matt Davis, coming to speak to us. Absolutely. And before we go into worship, let's pray. Yeah, Lord, as it comes to the countdown to Christmas and Advent, it seems too early, um, but it's coming. We just want to focus on uh, what Christmas is all about, and it is all about you, Jesus. Um, and as we uh, listen to the worship, we pray that we can really focus on you. You bring life, abundant life, to dry dead places, dry dead places. You bring life, yeah, you bring life, our hearts awaken, hearts awaken. over the sound heaven is coming down to earth send your wind rattle dry bones you call us out from our tombstones heaven is coming down to earth Heaven is coming down to earth You bring life, abundant life To dry dead places, dry dead places Yeah, you bring life, our hearts 
Hey everybody, lovely to be with you this morning. We're going to be reading from Luke chapter 2, verse 1 to 21. So if you've got your Bible, we're going to read that together now. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Don't be afraid, I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Saviour has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to those on whom his favour rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they'd seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherd said to them but Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen which were just as they had been told on the eighth day when it was time to circumcise the child he was named Jesus the name the angel had given him before he was conceived So God, we thank you for these words, we thank you for your Bible, and we thank you for this story of Christmas. And God, we pray that as we dig into this passage this morning, that you would speak to us. Amen. So, Christmas is coming, everybody. I know there will be some of you out there who are absolutely dismayed that it is the 28th of November, and we are talking about Christmas. I have my Christmas jumper on. This is my middle ground Christmas jumper. I feel like this is a Christmas jumper you could probably get away with any time of year because it's kind of brown but it has got a reindeer on it which we all know signifies Christmas but in a couple of days as soon as we hit 1st of December I'll be getting this bad boy out which is my elf jumper and you'll see me in that every day for the rest of December but whether you uh, would rather just talk about Christmas from the 24th of December to the 26th or whether you've had your Christmas tree up for months this morning I want to kick us off with the Christmas story And that is because it is the first Sunday of Advent today. And I want to bring us back to the announcement made by the angels to the shepherds that the Saviour has been born, the Messiah, the Lord. And every year I find myself 
reading the accounts in the Gospels of Jesus' birth and ask myself, why do I really only look at this once a year? There's a rapper called Propaganda and he said, the greatest story ever told that's hardly ever told. And why is it that we look at this stuff only once a year when this is potentially one of two of the most significant moments in the Christian calendar, the birth of Jesus and then probably also the death and resurrection of Jesus? This story is of monumental significance. It changed the course of human history. These events changed the way that God interacts with people. It was the moment a rescue mission was launched and was prophesied for thousands of years before. It was the moment that the Word became flesh. God became a human and made his dwelling among us, John chapter 1. So this year, I feel challenged not just to read this story a couple of times and sing some songs at some carol services about it before kind of packing it away until next Christmas. This year, I want to let the significance of this story sink into me and take root in a way that I don't always make space for. These angels pronounced three things. They said that this was good news that would bring great joy to all people. So first of all, good news. I wonder what your relationship with the news is. As a kid, I remember quite enjoying watching the news. I remember I would ask to stay up late so I could watch the news with my dad. It was very rare because 10 o'clock news is a little past my bedtime even now. But I would stay up and I remember stories in the news as a kid that I would get like drawn into and excited to hear what was happening. I remember a submarine rescue that went on for days when I was a kid and following that story in the news. But nowadays I find that I kind of reluctantly look at the news. I look at my BBC News app on my phone, others are available, but every time I open the news, I feel like I am confronted with bad news, sad news, fake news, just all this stuff that just doesn't make me feel like I wanna keep up with it. And I feel like sometimes I check the news out of more of a sense of duty that I should know what's going on in the world, rather than actually wanting to engage with this stuff. And it goes beyond the media, doesn't it? Maybe the last couple of years have, with, with lockdowns and job losses, financial stress, illness, maybe even losing loved ones, maybe you're feeling anxious about receiving any kind of news. Maybe when your phone rings, you dread answering it, or you, you hate that moment when you have to open your laptop in the morning and check your emails because what might be confronting you that needs resolving that day. Maybe you've gotten to the place over the last 18 months where you assume news is going to be bad, so you choose not to even engage with it or check it. And maybe you've had those moments where someone has sat you down to tell you some news. Maybe something sad or tragic, maybe a relationship breakdown or the loss of a loved one. We all know what it feels like to receive bad news to one degree or another. But on the other side of it, we all ache to hear good news, don't we? When good news comes along, it feels refreshing. If it's good enough, it brings life to us and hope to us. I think it's why so many people follow these like good news Instagram channels and YouTube channels and stuff, you know, that are filled with all these things. I found a few for you this morning. So um, this one first, this is a fashion designer, makes shoes that grow into apple trees instead of growing landfills. That's hopeful, isn't it? We can have loads of apples, out of our old shoes. I'm not sure anyone would want to eat apples made out of my old shoes, but that's fine. Look at this one. A courageous canine who lost his legs, but not his hope, is named 2021 Hero Dog of the Year. Man, that's uplifting. That is great stuff. Number three, a 12-year-old who uses his Boy Scout know-how to rescue a lost couple and an injured dog. Man, that is good news. And this is my favorite one. Thousands of bees make it out alive after being buried by volcanic ash for 50 days. Man, that is good news, isn't it? We need the bees, apparently. Pollinate flowers, keep us all alive. These good news stories, those ones are fun ones, but good news brings us hope, it uplifts us, it brings us joy. And this news that we're talking about today is not like these good news stories. This good news story is of such massive significance. It brought hope to the whole world, to the whole of creation, to humanity, that God was becoming a human to save us from our sins and to reconcile us into relationship with him. I wonder if you can think of a moment when you've been waiting for news of like a job interview and you got it, and that moment of receiving that good news. 
Or maybe you hear that someone's been given the all clear after tests and that moment of relief. Or maybe it's the moment you get told that someone you love is expecting a baby, that a baby has been born. Or maybe it's that moment, if you've been here, when he or she says yes to that big question. These good news stories, they uplift us, they bring us hope and joy. So in this story, what is the news that these angels are pronouncing to the shepherds on that hill? It says, the angels said to them, don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. And here's the news. Today, in the town of David, a saviour has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. So we're told two things. We're told that he is the saviour, the Messiah, and that he is the Lord. He is God, Yahweh. And the Jewish people, they had been waiting for this saviour, this Messiah, the anointed one, to come. And they'd had prophecies for hundreds of years before that an anointed one would come from the line of King David and he would establish God's kingdom here on earth. Check this out, Isaiah chapter 9, written thousands of years beforehand, says, For us, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing it and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. And you can do the study yourself. There are tons of these prophecies throughout the Old Testament of this Messiah who was going to come. And as you read the Gospels, you see these moments where the authors, the Gospel writers, they stop and they say, this is the moment Jesus provided, um, fulfilled this prophecy or that prophecy. Jesus' life was fulfilling these prophecies that were written hundreds and thousands of years before. And the second part of this angel's news is that this Messiah, the Anointed One, is not any human king, but he is God himself. He is the Lord. He is Yahweh, who put on human flesh and came to earth as a baby. John, 1, chapter, uh, John chapter 1, verse 14 says, The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. The news that these shepherds received was the fulfilment of a promise that they and a whole nation had been waiting for for generations and generations. But before this moment, there had been a period of 400 years where the Jewish people hadn't heard from God. God had been silent. And maybe you feel like you are in a season where you're not hearing from God. Maybe you thought you heard something a while ago that God was saying to you or a promise he had made and it feels like he's gone radio silent on it. Or maybe you feel alone in the dark at this moment. Maybe those shepherds felt like that, I don't know. On the en edge of that hillside, maybe they felt isolated and outside of the town. Maybe you feel alone in the dark in this season. And I want to say to you this morning that even though God might feel far off, he is right there next to you. That is the story of Christmas. Is there, if there's anything that the Christmas story reminds us is that we have a God who is so passionately committed to us that he would put on flesh and come to earth as a human being. He was born in the muck of life, the muck of a stable, to come and meet you in whatever muck of life you are going through at the moment. He is Emmanuel, God with us. That's Matthew 1, quoting Isaiah chapter 7 from ages before, that the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. They'll call him Emmanuel, God with us. And that leads us to the second part of this announcement that this good news would bring great joy. And maybe you've wondered before why God would choose to share this good news of great joy for all people with a bunch of shepherds on a hillside before anyone else. The first people to hear about this news that the king has arrived. And my grandparents uh, live in New Zealand and they used to own a whole bunch of sheep. I remember once when we were 10, the only time in fact, that we went to visit them in New Zealand, uh, me and my sister Lauren were being a bit of a pain in the house, I think. So they sent us outside to go and herd the sheep. Now, what we actually did was just run around a field for a couple of hours with their dog, and the sheep were just running in random directions. At one point, they got out into the road. It was awful. The whole thing, I think my, parent, my grandparents regretted it straight away because they could have lost all these sheep. Anyway, these sheep, we noticed, um, were not all the same. They weren't uniform. These sheep, there were different breeds of sheep in there. Some had long hair, short hair, like highland ones, ones with horns, spotted ones, different colours, all these different types of sheep. But the sheep in this story we're reading about here were probably special sheep because the Old Testament laws said that in order to pay for sins, 
that various animals had to be sacrificed to cover the sins of the people. And of course, all these animals that get sacrificed in the temple had to be farmed somewhere, they had to be reared. And the fields around Bethlehem, where these shepherds would have been, were some of the fields that were used to rear these special sheep that would be sacrificed in the temple. And so these shepherds are likely to have been farming sheep that were lined up to be sacrificed to pay for the sins of the people. Now, when the lambs were born, there was uh, the process for checking that these lambs were spotless, that they were without blemish so that they were good enough to be used in the temple. They would take these little newborn lambs and they would put them in a manger, a feeding trough, so that they could check that they didn't have any blemishes on them. And as many of you will know, some of the prophecies about the Messiah through the Old Testament spoke of a lamb. Isaiah chapter 53 says, He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Jesus, when he was a little older, he was walking along, and his cousin John saw him, and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And Jesus would ultimately be crucified, giving up his life as a sacrifice to cover our sins once and for all, the ultimate sacrificial lamb. And the angel said to the shepherds in verse 12, this will be a sign to you. You'll find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And so at the moment when Jesus was born, the shepherds were given a sign that they would understand that Jesus would be in a manger like a sacrificial lamb, something they would understand to show them that this baby was no normal baby. He was the saviour, the Messiah, the Lord that they had been waiting for who would ultimately establish God's kingdom on earth and give himself up as a sacrifice to create a way for all of us to be forgiven, to be free, and to be reconciled to God. So what we see through all those years of silence and confusion is that God never disappeared. We have the kind of God who planned intricately his birth in a feeding trough for animals near Bethlehem, hundreds, maybe thousands of years before, so that he could show a bunch of shepherds that he is who he said he is, and that he hasn't forgotten them. I'm sure there's deeper meaning as well. But he wanted to show these shepherds, I haven't forgotten you, I planned this. And the good news is that he hasn't forgotten you either. Whatever situation you're in at the moment, God hasn't forgotten you. Even if it feels like he's been silent, he is there, he is with you. And what's important to remember is that baby didn't stay a baby. That baby grew up and he died for, for you so you could have forgiveness and freedom. And most importantly, so you could have a relationship with God through the Holy Spirit. Jesus coming to earth means that we don't have periods of 400 years of silence anymore. The Holy Spirit is always with us. He's always ready to comfort us and counsel us and soothe us and lift us up and carry us through those moments that we need him there. The kingdom that Jesus established, Romans 14 says, is a kingdom of righteousness, peace, and joy. And I don't know if these shepherds were loving life in the moment when the angel appeared to them, but what we do say, see is that when the angels appeared, they were initially terrified. But by the end of this story, they were overwhelmed with joy. It says they were praising and glorifying God for all the things that they had heard and seen. The good news they received turned the fear that they had into joy. The good news of Jesus is hope, and hope transforms everything it touches. The baddie in the Hunger Games, Lord Snow, he says that hope is the only thing stronger than fear. And then the third part of this announcement from the angel is that this good news that will bring great joy is for all people. And the final part of this message says that, says that these shepherds were the first people and that it would bring joy to all people. And I wonder if you've ever been the first person that someone chooses to share some big news with. Maybe it's the moment someone finds out they're pregnant or a baby's born, or maybe it's the moment that they share that they're, that they're, getting, they're engaged or something like that. And you're the person they choose to share this news with. Imagine being the person who has chosen to receive the news that God is about to step into human flesh and be born as a baby. That the rescue mission that you've learned about for your whole life is about to begin. 
The kingdom that Jesus came to establish was one that would turn the whole world order upside down. It's a kingdom of righteousness, peace, and joy. It's a kingdom that wasn't first announced to world leaders or the rich or the elite or the influential, but it was brought about through a teenage girl, Mary, and first announced to a group of shepherds, probably the lowest in society on a hill in the middle of the night. In Matthew 1, we get this family tree of Jesus, genealogy. And in lots of circles today, not circles I mix in particularly, but genealogies, family trees are an important thing. You know, you, you um, show your pedigree and where you come from and all that sort of stuff. But in the genealogy of Jesus, we see something pretty unusual. We see that it includes people that you wouldn't want to include in your family tree. It includes sinners and Gentiles, people who weren't Jews, prostitutes. There's loads of women in that genealogy, which would have been really strange at that moment. People of all backgrounds that people wouldn't boast about being in their family tree, but the family tree of Jesus includes all these people. Matthew chapter 1, check it out. Jesus came for all people. He came for the outcast, the poor, the oppressed, the nobodies, as well as everyone else as well. And Mary, when she finds out that she's going to give birth to the Son of God, she sings a song that thanks God for using her to bring about this, this hope to the world. She sings of the reversal of her own social status, which points to this greater upheaval that is to come through the coming of the kingdom of God. God is going to take down rulers from their thrones, he's going to exalt the poor and the humble, and he's going to turn the whole world order upside down through the kingdom of God. So Jesus' kingdom was first revealed in the dirty places, in a, in a stable, in a manger, in a feeding trough for animals. And it was revealed to the poor, to shepherds, because God is here to bring salvation by establishing a new kingdom which is completely opposite to the world's. And so if you this Christmas are feeling like God is quiet or you're forgotten, I think again, this story is for you. Jesus came for you. If there's anything that the Christmas story tells us, it's that God loves you. He has not forgotten you. He is not quiet. He is Emmanuel, God with you. And I don't know, maybe the shepherds were told first for lots of reasons, but I wonder if one of them was maybe they needed to hear it first. Maybe they needed to know that they were chosen. They were not forgotten amongst the people. And maybe you need to know that today. Maybe you need to be reminded or told for the first time that you are chosen, you are loved, and God sees you. And so this year, I am challenged by three things. I am challenged to journey with the story of Christmas and to ask God to teach me new things over this season. I don't want this to be a story that we get to the end of December and I pack it away and forget about it for a year. This story is of huge significance to the whole world, the whole of creation, and particularly our relationship with God. Secondly, I want to remember that the hope in this story transformed lives and transformed history. And I want to use this story to spread hope to the people around me. There are people around us that we interact with day to day who don't know this story. They might have heard it at school growing up, but they don't know that this story, that God coming to earth brings hope to all people, into those dark places in their lives, those lonely places in their lives, the cold places. God brings hope and warmth and comfort. And then thirdly, that in those moments when I feel forgotten or alone or that I'm not good enough, this story says that I'm not forgotten or alone and that I am good enough. That God chose the little people of the world to do huge things, to bring his message of hope into the world. And I love the verse at the end here, verse 18. So the, the shepherds have been, they visited the baby, they've got all excited and told everyone they've gone back. And it says, verse 18, it's beautiful, but Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. And so I encourage you over this Christmas season, what does it mean for you to treasure up these things and ponder them in your heart? Maybe God wants to speak to you about new stuff this Christmas. So let's treasure those things and let's ponder them. Stir a passion in my heart, God. Let it overflow, let it overflow. Stir a passion in my heart, God. Let it overflow, let it overflow. Breathe on.
Hasn't it been great having Matt from our Aldershot congregation? If you live in Aldershot and you fancy coming in person, all the information for that service is on the Emmaus Road website. Mm -hmm. And if you feel like you just don't want the service to stop, then head to our Zoom room. 
which is a space where you can pray, you can chat with someone from Emmaus. Yeah, Zoom. <laughs> to access that, um, head to emmausroad.com forward slash chat and that's, uh, that's where you can go. Yeah. Next week we have Bill coming to speak to us, which we're super excited about. But for today, that is it. Absolutely everything. So thank you so much for joining us on this Sunday morning and we will see you next week. See you guys. Bye. Thank you.